Do you want to save money at the grocery store, eat more organic, whole foods, cultivate food security, and feel more connected to the earth? If so, then growing your own food is a no-brainer. You wouldn't believe how many people come to me claiming that they can't grow their own food. They think they don't have enough space, that they're too busy, or that they simply don't have what it takes. Perhaps you've fallen for one of these gardening myths. If you think you can't grow food, or if you think the only food that you have access to is what you buy in the grocery store, I have a life-changing webinar that you need to see. It's free and will help you unearth your inner gardener. I've helped thousands of people just like you learn to grow their own food, and I'm speaking from my own experience when I say that with the right knowledge in place, there is no such thing as a black thumb. With this webinar, you can begin making your garden dreams come true and start growing delicious, nutritious food for your family. Just text GARDEN to 44222 or go to IWANTTOGARDEN.COM and you will receive our free webinar about the seven key factors you need to know to grow your own food. Remember, that's GARDEN to 44222 or IWANTTOGARDEN.COM. You're listening to the Urban Farm Podcast, your partner in the Grow Your Own Food revolution. Whether you've just been introduced to urban farming or you're a lifelong advocate, we're sure you'll leave feeling more informed, equipped, and empowered to dig deeper into the soil of your local food economy. With you every step of the way, here's your host, Greg Peterson. Today on the Urban Farm Podcast, we have Jared Gulliford to talk about millennial farmers, the new generation of farming. At the age of 25, Jared moved back to the land he grew up on to start a farm. Gardening, since he was 18, he became interested in agriculture while at university. Now he is striving to produce food to share with and nourish his community while teaching others along the way. Taking advantage of an opportunity when his sister and her family bought the land next to their parents, he's attempting the multi-generational farm dream in the middle of suburbia. On degraded soil and with $10,000, he started from the ground up. Although Jared is the only farmer at this point, he hopes friends and family will join as the project becomes further established. Despite startup expenses, infrastructure needs, vehicle repairs, and everything else, he survived, and the inaugural year of Earth First Farm was a success. He has a half-acre market garden and homestead quantities of livestock, Then he plans for the farm to evolve from a working venture to a place where education and reconnecting with nature comes first. Jared is also the curator at Dr. Jim Duke's Green Pharmacy Garden in Fulton, Maryland, a sanctuary with over 300 species of native and non-native medicinal herbs. Welcome to the show today, Jared. Thanks for having me, Greg. Oh my gosh, absolutely. As I as I shared with you a little while ago, I think that uh, besides learn, everybody learning how to grow their own food, the second most important thing is that we get young people farming. So I'm very excited to have you for that. So I shared a bit about you. Can you fill in the blanks for us and share more about the path you took to get where you're at now? Sure. I guess my earliest kind of influence was when I was a child, me and my little brother, we were about six, seven, eight years old. And uh, we found a packet of watermelon seeds. Oh my gosh. We planted it in the sandbox and, (laughs) and it grew and we got, and we got some watermelons. So that to me was just pretty magical. And then, so from there on, I just kind of hung around the garden a little bit, mm-hmm. but starting around 18, I got more seriously into agriculture f- and permaculture mm-hmm. from the likes of Zet Polzer and Bill Mullison, and I started really reading a lot and just getting more and more into it. Had a little garden of my own. I was going to community college at the time, and I began spending every weekend I had any free time I had at farms, volunteering at Mm -hmm. farms, interning at farms. 
for three years. I interned and partly lived at Sycamore Spring Farm in Frederick, Maryland. Oh, nice. Yes. So she was primarily, she had a CSA, but she was primarily an animal uh, farmer. And I thought that was going to be my path for a little bit, but I ended up graduating college at uh, 21. Oh, congratulations, got, man. Yep, yep. I got a two-year jazz bass degree and then a four-year English literature degree. Wow. So uh, <laughs> helping me a lot in the vegetable garden. <laughs> but so uh, but right after uh, that. But, but you're well-read, I'll bet. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So then from – I learned a lot from Sycamore Spring Farm – But she was doing more animals, and I thought just as far as a young person with no land, not much money, plant, and um, to be honest, just the whole uh, moral thing about killing animals Mm. for a profit, Mm -hmm. I couldn't really jive with when it came down to it. Right. So I I, uh, shifted my focus to what I really loved, and that was plants. And so after I graduated college, I moved from, I was living in Baltimore City at the time. Mm -hmm. I moved to a tree house in New Hampshire. What? (laughs) Yeah. Uh, This was uh, in the White Mountains. Um, Wow. This was D Acres of New Hampshire. Josh Trout actually just released a book. Yep. Um, He was on the show recently. Yep, community scale permaculture. So mm-hmm. I I completed the permaculture internship there and once I finished that I came back to Maryland, lived at Sycamore Spring Farm in Frederick, Maryland again for a few few months trying to figure out how can I have my own venture. <clears throat> so I tried to do a small perennial nursery. Mhm. And that failed. That failed horribly. <laughs> okay. You gotta, um, <laughs> why, why did it fail? That failed because um, having my nursery stock and not having a real place to mm. – I was renting at the time. Uh-huh. And then – so I had planted a bunch of plants in the ground. And then, you know, the person I was renting for, from, they got divorced. I – I had to move out and all those trees I could not and shrubs. Yeah, you didn't have a I couldn't take that. with me. Yeah. But I, I was starting small at that point, but yeah. And then so <clears throat> I took one year in the corporate world. I was <laughs> in a cube. I'm su- yep. I'm surprised you lasted that long. I only lasted yeah. <laughs> ten months. <laughs> Yeah, it was rough, and uh, honestly, I did not feel good the entire time I was there, but I was in a cubicle, I was behind a computer screen eight hours a day, and I, after exactly one year, I quit, I took my savings of $10,000, and I moved to Blacksburg, Virginia, to study under Andrew Shanker, of Green Star Farm. I looked at his garden. It was black as potting soil. Uh huh. And he was making a living sending, you know, his kid through college. They grossed about $100,000 off 1. 1.5 acres. And he had been doing that um, for 25 years. Wow. And this is a, this is a north slope. Oh, my gosh. A, in a holler like it is so i was amazed Uh and so i studied for him under him for a season and then after that i leased and ran my own garden at highland farm which was uh near blacksburg virginia but a half hour away Uh and um they really allowed me to cut my teeth in trying to you know, be an entrepreneur trying to grow vegetables for a living. And I learned a lot there. And then, so I completed one season there. And then my sister bought the house next to my parents, the house I grew up in. Uh-huh. 
Awesome. And yeah, it, it all came together very quickly. And my dad asked me if I would like to farm his land. And it's a, it's a suburban lot. And it, how many uh, acres? I asked hesitantly. So his is three and a half, oh. but my sister right next to it is four and a half. So all together it's eight. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, we got neighbors, we have, there's people around and, uh, so I'm just concentrating on, <laughs> and yeah, it's not a farm, you know, it's a suburban lot. It's a, yeah. it's a, it's a house. So, right. and I had to really make a change because before I was on a farm, I was leasing from an established farm. Mm -hmm. We had a greenhouse, we had a walk-in cooler, we had fencing, we had everything. It was set up like a turnkey system yep. for me to just go in there and do it. And then I moved back home. It is starting from scratch. Yeah. Starting yeah. from the ground up. So I still had my $10,000 and I basically moved back December, 2015 oh, All right. or January, 2016 yep. and just hit, hit the ground running really. So you've had um, one growing season. Yep. Yep. I've had one growing season. This is the start of my second and yeah, that's where we are today. And you have a half acre. The market garden is a half acre uh -huh. with my, you know, where I let the chickens roam and some perennials that I've planted over the years and my hoop house. It's probably like three quarters of an acre of you space. Nice. Maybe, a, maybe, maybe an acre. If you count, I have some mulch hedgerow, hedgerows yep. that, uh, are pretty important to me. Cool. So how many generations of farmers are there in your family? Oh, well, that's a tricky question. My father is a salesman, traveling salesman. Uh -huh. My mom's a secretary. But on my mother's side, her uncles were all tried to be farmers. Uh -huh. So that's actually a cool story. There were six brothers on my grandmother's uh, side uh -huh. on my mom's um, in my mom's family. They grew up in Sheboygan, Michigan, uh -huh. and they all wanted to be farmers. That was their dream. They all failed but one. And and I looked at it. How did my one uncle survive when his one brother, he tried to be a dairy farmer? He mm -hmm. quit. He quit. Couldn't make enough money. But, you know, he ended up being a doctor, a heart surgeon. So oh, that well, worked out go. for him. Yeah. But uh, my my uncle Chet, you know, he had a million dollar farm. And I looked at what he did. And even as like a teenager, I saw he was diverse. He was doing mm. hay rides. He was raising buffalo. He was raising reindeer. He made it. He had a hunting preserve on the property mm. and he was doing vegetables. So it's like I learned that, you know, in diversity, yep. there's strength. Well, that's right out so. of permaculture, right? Yep, definitely. Yeah. yeah, that's right out of permaculture. You've, you've mentioned that word permaculture a couple of times. And for those for those of my guests that are, you know, deep into permaculture. I made that assumption about you. Um, can you, can you define it for us? What's your definition of permaculture? Well, honestly, permaculture is just theology. It is care for the earth. Mm -hmm. It's care for the people, but it's permanent agriculture. Mm -hmm. So it's thinking, it's planning on a way that's going to be good. The triple bottom line, good mm -hmm. for you, good for me, good for the people, good for earth, you yeah. know? So that's what I'm, I'm trying to, I have definite permaculture principles in anything I do. Yeah. But as far as me at this stage of my life, trying to make a, you know, a living off the bat, I, I chose annual vegetables mm -hmm. as my, as my main enterprise. Yay. Well, that's what people eat a lot of. Yeah, and yeah. you know, it only takes a month to grow a radish. Right, uh, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So what are you growing? 
I do uh, seasonal organic vegetables. I am non-certified at the moment. Organic? But it doesn't, yeah, I'm non-certified yeah. organic because, um, you know, honestly, my, um, my customers don't really care about my certification, but I, I strive. I have not even sprayed organic pesticides or, yeah. or you know, not even BT on my crops. Mm -hmm. And I, I've lost some crops because of that, but yeah. I strive to be beyond organic. Nice. So yeah, right now I'm growing, uh, I got a lot of cover crops in the field. It's mm -hmm. early May selling right now. P tendrils. Oh, nice. Baby red Russian kale a lettuce uh -huh. mix. Mm -hmm. I do a salad mix right now, which is red and green leaf lettuces with pea tendrils and red Russian. I had a very nice crop of bok choy come in that I was selling at the farmer's market yesterday. And then curly kale, baby curly kale. You are rocking it, man, all over the place. Yeah. Oh, and spinach, spinach, oh, yeah. radish, and turnip. How yeah. could I forget? Yeah, there you go. So that's that's what's growing right now. But you know, we'll come along, and tomatoes and all that stuff will be in. Are you starting early in a greenhouse or a hoop house? <laughs> yeah, I have all my tomatoes. So I'm in the Mid Atlantic. I'm in Maryland. Mm -hmm. I'm in the Piedmont of Maryland. So it is wet. It is humid. And if you try to grow tomatoes, I do have some field tomatoes, but they're very susceptible to blight in this climate. So I have about 100 feet of hoop house, 14, oh, nice. by, 14 by 96 feet. Mm -hmm. Whoa. And <laughs> filled those with cherry tomatoes mm -hmm. and different hybrids. But... Yeah, I also have some field tomatoes going, but as far as all my starts, I was growing them last year in the greenhouse, but I work part-time at the green pharmacy garden, so oh, coming right. home and watering on my lunch break, like really tough. <laughs> trying to like balance it all. So actually I built out a little nursery room. Uh huh. It's an eight by eight room and I can, I can fit 50, about 50 trays, about 50 trays of seedlings. And those are the standard 10 by twenties. Uh huh. So, and that's indoor under grow lights. And that was really you know, not ideal for me, but a real game changer as far as being able to grow the amount of seedlings I want because oh, yeah. I only have to water that every other day. So it allowed me to be able to go to my part time job rather than like running home and watering. But I think in the upcoming years, I'll just install an automatic watering system. Yeah, I was going to ask you if you were looking toward auto watering or drip tape. Are you familiar with drip tape? Yeah, 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 I have drip tape on the, my in ha entire half acre garden. Oh, good. Yep. So you are focusing on growing beyond organically. What challenge are you facing to keep this ethic and keep this process going? Well, it certainly hasn't been easy. There's a lot of challenges every day. I started with a soil that was 5.5 pH. Oh my gosh. The, I, I got my soil test. I took it to Crop Services International. Uh -huh. My consultant said, set your expectations very low. Oh my gosh. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> but, um, That's not good news. It, no. <laughs> No, it wasn't. But I spread about on a half acre, a thousand pounds of lime, mm. calcitic lime, mm -hmm. about 800 pounds of Tennessee brown rock phosphate oh, good. for a phosphorus source. Yep. And then I've added probably 10 yards of compost. Mm. And then I'm constantly cover cropping uh, oh, yeah. oats, oats, peas, rye, buckwheat. Crimson clover. I'm trying different things, trying different decomposing methods. 
But as far as keeping it organic, yeah, it's a challenge. Uh, a lot of the big organic farms that you'll see in Whole Foods, they're boom spraying organic chemicals and fungicides and yeah. pesticides. It's the only way they're able to grow their cabbage, their broccoli. Mm -hmm. And this is all so, done organically, though. Yeah, yeah, that's organically derived chemical, but pyrethrin is still toxic. It'll yeah. still burn the feathers off of, you know, our birds that are flying around the garden. Right. So that was not a path I was willing to take for the safety of me, the uh, surrounding wild wildlife and my family. So I use physical barriers, reme or agricultural fabric. Oh, yes. Uh huh. And that is a big chore covering, uncovering. And I use, yeah, moisture control, planting my tomatoes in hoop houses. Mm. So, you know, they're less susceptible to the blight. Right. But then I still have pest problems. Last year, I lost 400 row feet of broccoli. The harlequin beetles went right under the mm. agricultural fabric, and I just pulled it up, fed it to the chickens, and planted a cover crop. But I'm, I'm hopeful that, you know, through diversity, through just improving the soil, you improve the Im immune system of the plants and they're going to be able to battle off these pests, yep. these, these diseases better. So that's what I'm striving for. And, you know, it, it's a challenge, but I think my customers appreciate it and the, uh -huh. they taste the vegetables definitely taste great. So yeah, cool. So you're growing all this food. How are you getting it to market? What it, what are you doing? What was that process like? I sell at a farmer's market once a week. Mm -hmm. I also sell at a few restaurants in the surrounding area. And then I my goal now, now that I have my walk-in cooler set mm -hmm. up, right. I, I'm setting up a, a email list and I'll send out a weekly email saying, this is what I have for this week. This is what I'll have next week. And they can send me their orders and I can bag it up. It can be in the walk-in cooler. They mm -hmm. can just drive up my driveway, mm -hmm. pick up their bag and drive away. But I was lucky last year I at the farmer's market, I sold out nearly everything. Nice. Um, bas yeah, basically every Saturday. So, yeah. so I was lucky. Congratulations. I'll tell you, that's, that's not an easy life. I, while I was in college from 2001 to 2004, I was raising food in the front and backyard here and hauling nice. it to the, you know, hauling it to the farmer's market, although it was... You know, it did my heart well, and I did make money doing it. It's it's a lot of work. So congratulations, man. Yeah, it's tough because a farmer's market, for a farmer's market to be successful, there has to be, it has to be a place that people want to go. Yeah. So that's been a challenge in my area, you know. It can't be like an extra errand to run. It has right. to be a place they're already going. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So how did you get into restaurants? Because I, I tell people often when they ask me, the really the simplest way to kind of get, the, get into this process is find a restaurant or two and ask them what they like to grow. Yeah, that, that would be good. To be honest... It's been tough with restaurants because they're used to Cisco prices, our, our wholesale yeah. distributor prices. But I followed the advice of Nightlight Farms where he uh -huh. said, you might get denied 10 times, but on the 11th time, they'll get sick of you and they'll buy your produce. <laughs> so I Amen just keep, that. <laughs> I keep badgering them knocking on their door, you know, drowning them in vegetables. Yeah. Yeah, good for you, man. So what are your goals? 
I would say my goals are to be able to make a comfortable living mm-hmm. from the garden. Amen to that. Yeah. And still maintain a work-life balance. Last year, I worked at the herb garden 20 hours a week, but it was easily 70 hours a week in my garden. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it, it's you know, it's a constant grind. Oh, we can get set up, absolutely. Yeah, and it can wear you down, but um, then, you know, some things... There's an energy exchange. You go to the market and you're mm. near zombie-like stage because you're so tired and you're harvesting for 10 hours in the rain. But then people, bright-eyed and happy face, uh-huh. come and tell you how much they loved your produce yep. and how they fed their entire family on Thanksgiving with your turnips and your <laughs> potatoes. You know, it's yeah. so... It's stuff like that that keeps me going and having friends around me and family to like support, moral support. No one's really, uh, as far as helping out on the farm, you know, they have their own jobs and whatnot. Right. But as far as moral support, I have been blessed with more than enough. Everyone seems to be rooting for the garden. (laughs) Pun intended. Pun intended. Beautiful. (laughs) I'm going to shift on you, and I'd like for you to talk about a time you failed, how you overcame that failure, and what you might have learned from it. Okay. A big failure last year. I had, let's see, a thousand row feet of tomatoes, green tomatoes on them, Uh ripening up. I come out the next morning, they have been mowed down. They are completely eaten down to basically the nub and I could only imagine a deer herd came through and just completely demolished it and in my area it has been developed so rapidly Mm -hmm. I'm in between Baltimore and DC like we've been here for 30 years but the property value around of has just skyrocketed Uh uh-huh So because of all the development, all these deer have nowhere to go. And my garden is an oasis (laughs) in a desert. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that was really, really challenging because I budgeted for for a deer fence around the half acre garden my first year. Right. But what what I did not budget was the two thousand dollars worth of repairs on my farm truck. Um, that I just, you know, didn't, didn't see coming, didn't factor it in. And I would, I was on a very tight, strict budget. And so that didn't get built, but I have finished it this year. So, uh, this season we have the eight foot deer fence around the half acre garden. Oh, good. Yeah. So that's exciting. But yeah, so I come out my entire tomato crop, which I'm, you know, banking on right. is gone. It is completely gone. So I, I almost just gave up, pulled them all out and planted something else, but something told me not to. I, I know tomatoes are really resilient and they'll uh-huh. grow back. Oh yeah. So I, I just put twine around them and kind of made a little makeshift fence just with tomato twine. Mm-hmm. And that was enough to deter them. And amazingly enough, on my birthday, August 22nd, I go down to the garden and I see a beautiful, ripe, Cherokee purple heirloom tomato. Nice. And and I was like, oh, all right, they're they're coming in. So in September, I had bushels and bushels of tomatoes, and it ended up working out perfectly because everyone else at that time was out of out tomatoes. Of yep. So you know, sometimes it's best to be the first one with tomatoes at the market, but sometimes it's best, best to be the last. To be the last. Oh. Yeah. So that was kind of like, you know, a real turn of events where I was like, 
in complete despair to like <laughs> really thanking the deer for putting me in such a great situation. Yeah. But wow. Yeah. So that was fun. So what do you consider your biggest success? I would say just surviving the first year. Oh, nice. I, the first year I was living in a flooded, so an unfinished basement that flooded every time it rained. Oh my gosh. So it was really just like devoting myself to this garden Uh and like really doing anything to like make it grow. Uh Uh-huh. And things started growing miraculously, and this year built out the basement to where it's now a studio apartment, got my friend to come with a bobcat, regraded it, poured concrete, basement no longer floods, I don't wake up to puddles of water in my living area. Uh-huh. Yeah, and, <laughs> that's a good thing. <laughs> Yeah, and the the garden is growing. You know, I had soil consultants say it was impossible. I had yeah. Don't get P- your hopes up, man. Yeah, yeah. I had <laughs> PhD, you know, professors tell me that my land was too wet. It's too saturated. It's never gonna work. But last year in April. I didn't even even know if I was going to be able to garden, if I was going to uh-huh. have a farm. But then I found a guy after tr- knocking on 20 doors. Finally, someone, one farmer was left in the area with who had a tractor with a plow and a tiller. Uh-huh. And late April last year, we broke ground, got it tilled up. And from there on, I built my permanent raised beds. And now oh, that helps with the water drainage. Yeah. From from going from any time in the fall and spring, that area was a swamp. I was planting lettuce in the rain yesterday. Oh, like, nice. Dra- drains incredibly now. It's beautiful, silty soil. You just yeah. had to work it up a bit. Right. Excellent. Yeah. So what drives you? I would say just um, vegetables is a big motivator. I like to eat. I like to, I like very, I'm almost a snob when it comes to what I eat. Yeah. And there, to me, there's nothing better than being able to go outside and harvest my dinner every day, like barely ever buying any groceries. Yeah. And being able to, I love going selling at the farmer's market because I can barter with all my mm, farmer, my friends. farmer neighbors yep. and friends. And I'm getting raw milk. I'm getting great pastured beef and pork and, you know, what honey, like anything for leftover produce. Uh-huh. One of the things I used to do was when I was done at the farmer's market uh, in you know, 2001, 2002, I'd, I'd pick up everything that I had left over and I took it to my friend Susan, who owned a restaurant, and she'd always give me lunch in exchange for what I had left over. <laughs> yeah. 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 I just, I traded yesterday for, it's called Moshi's Rice Bowls, and that was oh, great. It's, nice. Cor- yeah, Korean style. Yeah. And he is another like live food vendor. Yeah at the market. So that was nice on a cold and soggy Thursday. Yeah. But I would say besides the vegetables, it's the lifestyle Mm. and being, being able to, uh, wake up, not commute, not have to get in my car and sit in traffic for an hour before (laughs) I get to work, but also just to be outside Mm. to, you know, the changing of the seasons, like see, I, I'm out there every day. I'm seeing the trees leaf out. I'm, I'm seeing the blooms as the calendar goes by the different blooms of the seasons. Uh-huh. And, and really just like every year, the more I'm gardening and observing, the more I really see like all the different species that are just surrounding me and, yeah. From trees to shrubs to ground, 
cover. It's yeah. it's pretty spectacular. Nice, nice, nice. Hey, I'm all about education, and I have to know: is there a book that's been influential for you in this process in your life? Greg, I would say as of late, I would have to give a lot of credit to Curtis Stone and his book, The Urban Farmer, mm -hmm. as well as Jean-Martin Fortier, The Market Gardener. I'm, I'm looking more towards Curtis Stone's teachings and writings mm -hmm. and videos more and more because... You know, I'm on a half acre, he's on a third of an acre, and he's making a hundred grand. So that's pretty spectacular. And yep. so I'm changing, like, now he's won me over on the, on the tarps. I was not a fan of using tarps in the garden. I thought it looked ugly, but I've been using it to decompose cover crops. Mm -hmm. And it, in two weeks, they're ready to plant. And just just general efficiencies that he mentions of like, you know, keeping your tools where you want them, mm -hmm. uh, making everything streamlined, and then really like valuing your time. So because of that, this year, I'm really changing my crop list of things I'm growing. Mm hmm. I'm not growing onions anymore, potatoes, cabbage, broccoli, all these things the big farms that I'm competing against cream you on them. Yeah. They do, yeah. They I, sell it for so I, cheap. Exactly. I cannot compete. What I can compete on is the arugula, the salad mm -hmm. mixes, the head lettuce, because I'm picking it that morning. It's yeah. so fresh. It'll last in your fridge for at least a week Yeah. when they're, they're buying it from California. And by the time it gets to you, it's, you have lettuce for a day or two in your fridge and it starts to right. wilt. So that's what I'm gearing towards now. Cool. So what one final piece of advice do you have for our listeners? Uh, the final piece of advice, especially for other millennial farmers, mm -hmm. as a 26 year old, I am the, you know, I don't know many other people my age that are doing it now because the access to land is so mm -hmm. difficult. Mm -hmm. So I'm renting from my family and, you know, he, uh, my parents don't necessarily always, <laughs> my dad's more of a lawn guy, but, um, you know, he, I'm just trying to give him so many vegetables that <laughs> he, he won't be able to refuse. But the main advice is to start small. Do not take out large loans. Don't till up a whole two acre garden and expect to do it all yourself. Start small, a small investment, set a budget and start from there. Um, a lot of people, a lot of like friends I have just have all these lofty dreams when it's like, you know, you can start a little 5,000 square foot garden and be growing tons of food. Like you don't have to necessarily, you know, work your corporate job until you're 40 years old and then buy a farm. You uh -huh. know, it's it's just a matter of starting small. Number one, knowing what you want. Yeah. But then starting small, not getting into debt and persevering, really, because it's going to be hard. It is going to be the hardest thing you've ever done. Yeah. Yeah, but it is so fulfilling. It's very fulfilling. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us on the show today, Jared. Yeah, thanks, Greg. I really appreciate you having me out. Absolutely. How can our listeners get a hold of you? They can go to my website, earthfirstfarm.com. I'm also on Facebook, Earth First Farm, and Instagram. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my email address is earthfirstfarmer at gmail. And any questions or advice or, you know, just want to say hello, I'm completely open to it. Perfect. Perfect. You can find show notes from today's podcast at urbanfarm.org forward slash millennial farmer. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for joining us on the Urban Farm Podcast. 
Do you want to save money at the grocery store, eat more organic, whole foods, cultivate food security, and feel more connected to the earth? If so, then growing your own food is a no-brainer. You wouldn't believe how many people come to me claiming that they can't grow their own food. They think they don't have enough space, that they're too busy, or that they simply don't have what it takes. Perhaps you've fallen for one of these gardening myths. If you think you can't grow food, or if you think the only food that you have access to is what you buy in the grocery store, I have a life-changing webinar that you need to see. It's free and will help you unearth your inner gardener. I've helped thousands of people just like you learn to grow their own food, and I'm speaking from my own experience when I say that with the right knowledge in place, there is no such thing as a black thumb. With this webinar, you can begin making your garden dreams come true and start growing delicious, nutritious food for your family. Just text GARDEN to 44222 or go to IWantToGarden.com and you will receive our free webinar about the seven key factors you need to know to grow your own food. Remember, that's GARDEN to 44222 or IWantToGarden.com. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen three days a week for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.